As we begin this morning, the passage that I would like to you for you to turn to is found in the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 6, Ephesians chapter 6. Back in the 1990s, a gentleman by the name of Frank Peretti released a book that quickly became a bestseller, even among secular people. It was quite a a popular book at the time. The title of the book was This Present Darkness. And the book was an attempt to depict the spiritual battle that takes place all around us that is unseen unnoticed by us. And he did a a, a good job. And I'm not saying the book is all theologically correct. It's a novel. So if you've never read it, go ahead, give it a read. It's a good read. But it shows, again, the demons and the devils and the minions of Satan who are fighting all the time against you, against me, and in particularly against a church that would preach the Bible. You know, the devil doesn't care too much about the church down the road where people are kneeling and standing and bowing and, you know, going like this all the day. What does he care about them? They're all lost anyway. Let them lead the blind, the blind leading the blind. Let them do it. What does he care about that? Well, what he does care about is a people that strive to be godly, a people that strive to be holy, a church that strives to use the Bible, a church and a people that strive to be evangelical and telling people what the Bible says. That he doesn't like. And that was some of what was written in this book, and I do believe is accurate. Satan is out to stop anything that would impede his rule of the kingdom of darkness. And so, even from this passage, and that's what the book was taken from, in verse 12, well, if you back up even in verse 11, where he speaks about putting on the full armor of God. Why? So that you would be able to stand firm against the schemes of God the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. People, this is our battle. This is what we're up against. There are battles taking place all around us and that we are involved in. The battle is for the souls of men, for your soul, for my soul. Battles that are supernatural. Battles that are beyond our sight and beyond our comprehension. And although some may think dealing with this subject may be trivial, this is a real concern to the Christian. To be able to fight the good fight, to be able to stand firm for Christ against the schemes of the devil. And in fact, the outcome of this battle has a lot to do with the birth of Jesus Christ. We're going to get to that in the message today. And so for the past few weeks, we've been looking at the scriptural teaching from the scriptures, from the Bible, Regarding angels, what I've entitled the other created beings. And our first stop was to answer the question, who are these guys? Where do they come from? And we saw from the Bible that they are created beings, created by God. The exact time they were created is uncertain. Could have been, you know, years and years and epochs before the creation of the world. Some believe that they were created at the creation of the world, maybe on the third day. But they were created by God. We went on to deal with what angels are like. They are spiritual beings, spiritual bodies. They do not die. They are depicted in the Bible as men always, and even as armies, armies of God. 
And although the word angelos, which is a transliteration to angels, means messengers, we saw that angels are more than messengers. They are worshipers of God, warriors for God, deliverers of the saints, and many other things. We are going to look into those things beginning next week. But last week, or I should say two weeks ago, we began to look at what I've called the bad guys. The fallen angels. Satan and his minions. And I don't wish to give any glory to Satan whatsoever, but believe me, he's mentioned in the Bible a lot. And so if you're going to deal with the whole counsel of the Word of God, and you're going to deal with all of what the Bible teaches, at some point, you've got to deal with this. And so we're looking at Satan, his minions, Beelzebub, Lucifer, the devil. He has many names, and we looked into his origin as well. And saw that he too is a created being. He is not eternal. He is not all-knowing. He is not all-powerful. He is a created being, created by God, who alone is eternal, who alone is all-powerful, who alone is omniscient. Satan is not. God is. He is a created being. He is, was created perfect, and he fell into sin. And we saw that was from pride. So his origin is created. His rebellion was from pride. He wanted to be worshipped. He wanted to be God. But he was judged by God and cast down. We're going to see a passage about that in a little while. And then we looked at not only his origin, his rebellion, but his dominion. He is the prince of the power of the air, the prince of the power of the world. He is a, the ruler of the kingdom of darkness. Yet we stress again that God is ultimately in control. He is only able to do what God gives him permission to do. And we see that in the scriptures in such places as Job chapter 1 and 2. Now last Lord's Day, we went on to deal with how he rules. Who he is, and then how he rules. We saw that he is indeed the enemy, and we saw that he rules with injustice. He has no laws, no rules, no integrity. He desires to overturn God's justice. In Matthew chapter 4, we saw that he would promise anything. He promised Jesus, even. But he has no way to fulfill the promise. He rules with injustice. We saw that he rules with malice, hatred. He's a tyrant. He treats all of his followers with evil. Why would anyone follow him? We saw that he rules with deceitfulness. And we saw from the scriptures that he's a liar, an accuser, a tempter. He is a snatcher away of the truth. He is a blinder of the eyes of men, leaving men blind so that they don't even see what's going on. They're duped. That's what he does. A liar. Accuser of the saints, tempter of the people of God trying to ensnare us, a snatcher away of truth, a blinder of the eyes of men. He's a false teacher, twisting the truth. He is a misleader, deluding spirits with men, sending deluding spirits. And he is an imposter. He comes even as an angel of light. And so we ended up looking at how not only who he rules, uh, not only how he rules, but who he rules. He has his own minions that follow him, his own fallen angels. And if you're not saved, he rules you. He is the ruler of the lost, the ruler of the kingdom of darkness. Now, people, this is why there are so many today that are fallen into such wickedness and such sin. You realize today that people don't even think about sin. You know, when I, um, I hate to say stuff like this, shows my age or whatever, but when I was a kid, you didn't live with somebody before you got married. It was a, it was a scandal if you did. Divorce was a rare thing. I've told some of you this before, that when I was growing up and I was in school, high school, I only knew one kid in my class whose parents were divorced. And now I would imagine that it would be almost all of them, or at least half of them. We know today that what is allowed by our government 
And even in the past week, they passed this bill called the Respect of Marriage Act. And it is exactly the opposite. It is the disrespect of the marriage given in the Bible. How is this happening? How is this happening? Satan blinds the eyes of men. You want to talk about a conspiracy theory or a conspiracy? This is it. Satan is taking over our nation. He's been let loose, blinding the eyes of men, bringing so much evil and wickedness. People don't even seem to care. All they care about is themselves, their own little world. If I'm okay, everything's okay. And they don't even see the wickedness that is happening in our own nation. Now, I want to open up this passage right here in front of us just a little bit before we move on today. In the text we see in verse 12, the Apostle Paul says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces, against this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness. That's our battle. That's our struggle. The word that he uses there in struggle is a word that refers to a wrestling match in Olympic wrestling. That, that's really the, the root of the word, the struggle. It is, as you can picture in your mind, that this struggle in wrestling, we wrestle against the world forces. We wrestle against this present darkness. This is what he's talking about. We're in the match of our lives against Satan, against the spiritual forces of darkness. And most people don't even know. Most people don't even consider that they're in a battle against spiritual forces. Of course, lost people don't care. We need to care. This is what we're up against day after day. We struggle, we wrestle to live godly and holy lives. And it is hard. There's so much sin, so much temptation from the tempter. This is our struggle. And what I want to do today is to go a little bit further into this and see what the Bible tells us about this battle and about the ultimate outcome for God's people, for you and for me. And so we looked here at who Satan is. We looked at how Satan rules. We looked at who Satan rules. And now I want to look at how God defeats Satan for his people. And I want you to see, if you don't see anything else, to understand that his outcome is sure. It's certain. He is done for. A couple of headings I'm going to look at. Kind of, They kind of cross over into one another. But the first one I want for us to see is God has destined him. Look, if you would, please, to Matthew 25. God has destined Satan. Now, we looked at this passage last week, but we're going to look at it from a different angle today. Matthew 25. We pick up again in the context. In the latter half of the chapter, Jesus is talking about the judgment, beginning in verse 31. He says that when the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, He will sit on His glorious throne and all the nations will be gathered together before Him and He will separate them from one from another like a shepherd, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And He will put the sheep on His right and the goats on His left. The King will say to those on His right, that would be the saved people, Come, you who are blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. You get the picture. We all know we're familiar with this passage. As those on his right, the sheep, 
And there's a lot more on his left, the goats. But he says to those, come and inherit the kingdom which has been prepared for you from the foundation of the world. You know, we read in Ephesians chapter 1 that God chose us in him from before the foundation of the world. And here he tells us that the kingdom of heaven, that place where we will go, has also been prepared for us from then, from before the foundation of the world. It's all God's plan. He's sovereign. He's in control. You'll go to be with him. Now I want to look at what he says against the others. We're going to skip over some. I want to skip down to where he says in the text regarding the lost in verse 41. And then he would also say to those on his left, that's the lost, depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire. That's hell. People don't believe in that anymore. Preachers don't want to preach about it anymore. You upset people, you offend people, you get people mad. But people, that's it. You go to heaven or you go to hell. One or the other. I want you to go to heaven. I don't want you to go to hell. So I'm warning you. As Jesus warned. He's going to say on that judgment day, Depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire. But look what he says next. Which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. Hell's been prepared for the devil from before the foundation of the world. Prepared for the devil and his angels. They will be cast into the eternal fire, into hell. And notice, it's already prepared. In other words, there's no doubt about it. He's destined to hell. It's sealed by the hand and power of God. It's a done deal. Look at John chapter 12. Gospel of John chapter 12. Now, I, I know we turn to a lot of passages and we're going to turn to a lot. I won't be spending a lot of time there, but I want you to see these passages with your own eyes. I don't like to just say, oh, in John, whatever, it says, I want you to see it. I want you to learn how to use your Bible. I want you to see what the Bible says here in John chapter 12. And again, notice Jesus says in verse 31 of John chapter 12. Now judgment is upon this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. It's a done deal. There is no doubt. God has destined him to destruction. Now I'm asking you to turn all the way to the beginning of your Bibles in Genesis chapter 3. As we see next, not only is he destined, he's destroyed. God has destroyed him. It's already done prophesied way back in the beginning of the Bible. So here we turn to what is commonly called the Proto-Evangelium. Proto-Evangelium being the first explanation, the first given in the Bible of the Gospel. Chapter 3 of the book of Genesis, and we know that this is in regards to the fall. The serpent, that is the devil, first mention of the devil. The serpent tempts Eve. Eve eats, Adam eats, and they fall, they sin. The woman said to the serpent in verse 2, from the fruit of the trees of garden we may not eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the, I'm sorry, from the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said you shall not eat from it or touch it lest you die. Serpent, you shall not die. God's a liar. Don't listen to God. Listen to me. Ah. Eve goes, oh yeah, I can listen to him. I can listen to whoever I want. I'm not going to listen to God. I know better than any of them. So she takes and she eats. And what happens? We read in verse 8. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. 
And then the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? You have to understand, you have to picture in your minds that ever, every other time, for, until the fall of man, they would have been so delighted to see God. So eager to see their creator. But now the, they hide themselves. And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. And God said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I have commanded you not to eat? It's not like God didn't know. So what does the man do? The man blames his wife. And the man said, the woman, she made me do it. So he blames his wife. Men always do that. He blames his wife. He blames his wife. But not only did he blame his wife, he blamed God. The woman which you gave me. He blamed the woman, he blamed his wife, and he blamed God. No self. Not my sin. Her sin. Yours, God. And what does the woman do? And then the woman said, in verse 13, the serpent deceived me and I ate. She blamed the serpent. Which is also in turn blaming God. But she blamed the serpent. And now what we have is the condemnation, not on the woman or the man first, but on the serpent first. And in that is the proto-evangelium. Verse 14, the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you more than any, more than all cattle, more than every beast of the field. On your belly you will go, and dust you will eat all the days of your life. Now here's the gospel presentation in Genesis 3. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. Now, the language is not exactly the same, and Hebrew isn't easy to understand sometimes, but it is more accurately rendered, he shall crush you on the head, and you will bruise him on the heel. So here's what he's saying. In the course of eternity, in the course of all things, yes, you're going to bruise him on the heel, but he will crush you on the head. And who is it that he's talking about? The seed of the woman. The seed of the woman. And who is that? Rush forward with me, if you will into the Gospels and turn to John chapter 19. John chapter 19. And as you're turning there, I remind you that even at this time of the year, although there's no likely way that Jesus was born in December, shepherds would not have been in the fields in December, there's no likely way Jesus was born in December, and yet, this is the time that people talk about the birth of Christ. So Christ has come. The incarnation has occurred. Jesus Christ left glory and came to dwell among men. And he lived a spotless, sinless life for approximately 33 years. And now we have the result and the fulfillment of Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. In John chapter 19, and Jesus is on the cross. And people, I tell you, the Bible never does anything by accident. There's never anything in Scripture that wasn't meant to be there or happened coincidentally. And the Gospel writer John records what happened as Jesus hung on the cross more than the other Gospels. And he speaks about verse 25, Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother 
his mother. Remember that. That's Mary, his mother, and his mother's sister, and the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. But that's his mother there. And when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, what? Woman! The seed of the woman. The seed of the woman will crush the serpent. Satan thought he was winning. Satan thought he had beaten him. And yet, Jesus says, Woman, say to the woman, Satan, you're about to be crushed. He thought he was winning as Jesus is hanging on the tree, hanging on the cross, and indeed gives up his life on the cross and is buried in a tomb. But on the third day... He's roused, risen again from the dead. Satan is crushed. Satan is defeated. Satan loses. This is the fulfillment of that promise in Genesis chapter 3. The seed of the woman crushes him. Now, look at Revelation again. We'll start at Revelation 12 and just touch on this really quickly. Revelation 12. Revelation 12 is a very interesting text. Very interesting passage. Verse 1, a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun and the moon and under her feet and on her head a crown of twelve stars. And she was in, and she was with child. And she cried out, being in labor and in pain to give birth. And if you look down, verse five. And she gave birth to a son, a male child, who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and to his throne. This is re, 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 regarding the birth of Christ. Almost all commentators agree. This is the birth of Christ. The one who is to rule the nations. But now look at verse 7. And there was a war. There was war in heaven. Michael and his angels wage, waging war with the dragon. The dragon and his angels waged war. And they were not strong enough. That is, the dragon and his angels were not strong enough. And there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who is called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. And he was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. Here we have again the devil his angel, Satan, being cast down out of heaven. And I want to, I can't take too much more time here, but I want you to look at what he says in verse 10. Now the salvation and power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of the brethren has been thrown down. He who accuses them before our God day and night. And they overcame him. Because the blood of the Lamb. This is how we live. This is how we defeat Satan. By the blood of the Lamb. Because we're saved by Christ. And the word of their testimony. They did not love their life. Even when faced with death. For this reason rejoice O heavens. And you who dwell in them. Woe to the earth and the sea. Because the devil has come down to you having great wrath. Why does he have great wrath? Why does he have such animosity towards the people of God? Knowing that he only has a short time. He's destined to be destroyed. Look at chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. Verse 
the final judgment. Verse 10, And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast of the, and the false prophet are also, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Make your, let your minds go back to what you read with me in Matthew chapter 25. When Jesus promised that the devil will be thrown into hell. That was created from before the foundation of the world for him and his followers. And here it is. He's thrown into hell. And the followers are what is written next right after that. But Satan is destined to be destroyed. Why on earth do people follow him? You read the end of the book. He loses. He's going to hell. There's no way he's going to win. And yet people think, oh, I'm going to follow Jesus, uh, Satan. I'm going to worship Satan. I'm going to do homage to Satan. And he's going to make me powerful. He's going to make me wonderful. He's going to give me this. He's going to give me that. No, he's not. He's going to give you hell. That's it. For eternity. Come to Christ. You follow Christ. And you go to be with Him in heaven. A heaven prepared for you from before the foundation of the world. The Bible clearly shows that Satan is destined to be destroyed. Let's see another thing. Let's see that God has delivered us from him. If you would, please look at Acts chapter 26. I'm going to make some of this more practical to you and to me. Acts chapter 26. Here we have the Apostle Paul giving his testimony. His testimony to the king that he's standing before. Here in Acts chapter 26. And he says in verse 12, While I was engaged, as I was journeying to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests, O oh, admit at midday, O king, as King Agrippa, I saw on the way a, a light from heaven, brighter than the sun. Now, I was mentioning to one of our younger members recently that he's giving his testimony. And a testimony should contain at least three things. The then, the when, and the now. He speaks about the then when he was engaged in journeying to Damascus to on the chief priest, and what was he going to do? He was going to persecute the saints. He was a persecutor of the saints. That's my then. And the when is at midday, O king. I saw on the way a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining all around me, and those who were journeying with me. And when I had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in Hebrew dialect, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Notice he was persecuting the church, but Christ says he's persecuting me. You persecute one of these Christians, you persecute Christ. You fight against God. It is hard for you to kick against the goals. And I said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and stand on your feet. For this purpose I have appeared to you to appoint you as a minister and a witness not only to the things which have you have seen, but also to the things in which I will appear to you, rescuing you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you, to open their eyes so that they may turn, listen, turn from darkness to the light and from the dominion of Satan to God that they may receive forgiveness 
of their sins and inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. What's the gospel message that Paul brings? Repent! Turn from your sins! Be rescued from the kingdom of darkness! And be saved into the kingdom of light. This is what he's selling him. That the gospel, it is the word of God, the gospel that opens the blind eyes of men to be able to see the truth. To be able to see what God has said, what God has done. To be able to see the sin all around. To be able to understand what the things really are happening today. I once was blind, but now I see. Why? Because God opens eyes. Verse 18, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light. I call on you to turn from the kingdom of darkness. Turn from the kingdom of Satan to the kingdom of light. You young people, you need to be delivered from the bondage of sin and the, sin, the kingdom of Satan. Some of you think it's trivial. Some of you think it's a joke. It's not. Look at Colossians chapter 1 really quick. Colossians chapter 1. Verse 13. What does God do when He saves you? He has rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son. That's now, folks. The kingdom of Jesus is not something that is going to happen years and years from now in some millennial reign. If you're not in the kingdom of Jesus now, you're not saved. His kingdom is now. We have been transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. The kingdom of His beloved Son. Look at Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2, down to verse 14. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same. You know what that is? That's the incarnation. I told you this has to do with the incarnation of Christ. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same. And through death, he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil. And might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. He came to free us from the fear of death and from the power of darkness. Rendering him powerless for us. You know how you don't constantly get killed and maligned and beaten and everything else? God protects you, rendering Him powerless unless God allows in your life. Now this is what the Gospel offers. Eternal life in the kingdom of of light. And so we looked at who Satan is, how Satan rules, who Satan rules, and how God defeats him. But I want to look at one more, how we defeat Satan. And for this, look at 1 Corinthians. And we'll be quick. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And the first one I want to say is by humbling ourselves. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, look down to verse 6. Now these things happened as examples for us so that we would not crave evil things as they also craved. Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and stood up to play. Nor let us act immorally as some of them did 
and 23,000 fell in one day. Nor let us try the Lord as some of them did and were destroyed by the serpents. He's talking about Israel, of course. Nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as examples and they were written for our instruction upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore, listen to this, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he does not fall. Don't think you're so powerful that you can overcome or defeat the devil. You can't. Let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. No temptation has overtaken you, but as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with that temptation will provide a way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. Remember, who's the tempter? God does not tempt. James tells us, God does not tempt anyone with sin. The tempter is Satan. But God gives you the strength to endure and gives you, provides for you a way of escape. So humble yourselves. Recognize that you need God's help. We are able to escape by humbling ourselves. And next, by putting on the armor of God. Now look at that text that we've been looking at. In Ephesians chapter 6. It is my intention to do a series on the armor of God. I'm not sure. I may do it even at the beginning of next year, which is only weeks away. But it is my intention to do a series on the armor of God. But I'm just going to point to this, as the Apostle even tells us, that this is one of the ways that enables us to defeat Satan. So first of all, by humbling ourselves, and then by fleeing from sin, as we are to flee the devil. But here, he by putting on the armor of God. Verse 11, put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. That's why we put it on. And so he speaks about what that armor is. In verse 14, stand firm, having girded your loins with truth. You'll never defeat Satan in your life without truth. The truth of God's word. Christians know the truth. It is the truth that opens your eyes, that shines in the dark place and lets you see the light. Verse 15, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Bring the gospel of peace to men. Bring the gospel of peace to all men. It is, I, I hesitate to use the term, it is easier to stand firm and be holy for Christ when you're preaching or bringing the gospel to others, when you're being evangelical, when you're telling others about Christ. And so the gospel of peace is in your heart and you're telling others and bringing others. And you have that peace in your heart. As he goes on to say, the truth and then the peace. And then verse 16, in addition to all taking up the shield of faith, you must have faith to extinguish the flaming arrows of Satan. And then verse 17, the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. If you don't have salvation, you're not going to stand against the devil. You're, you'll be following the devil. So all of these are things that we can go into as we open up this text. But I want for you to turn now, if you would please, to one last passage in regards to this, James chapter 4. 
delivering us from the power of Satan. James chapter 4. And here he says, I'm going to pick it up in verse 4. It's a pretty strong language. You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you not think that the Scripture speaks to no purpose? He jealously desires the Spirit which He made to dwell in us. But He gives a greater peace, therefore, it says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Again, humble yourself. Verse 5, uh, 7 rather, Submit therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Resist the devil. And so we humbling, we're humbling ourselves. We're fleeing from sin. We're putting on the armor of God. And we're resisting the devil. These are ways that we win. These are ways that we win that wrestling match, that struggle that we read about in Ephesians 6 and verse 12, that battle that we're engaged in. These are ways. We flee the devil. We flee sin. We turn from sin and the devil flees from us. And why would that happen? I told you again that this all has to do with the incarnation of Christ. Our last passage today is 1 John chapter 3. Just a couple of pages. 1 John chapter 3. Verse 7. Little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. That's what we've been saying. If you're involved in sin, if you're lost, you're of the devil. However, look, the Son of God appeared for this purpose to destroy the works of the devil. Why did Jesus come? To give his life a sacrifice for sin? To be sure. But one of the results of that is that we will be freed from the works of Satan. We will be those who have victory over sin in Christ because he destroys the work of the devil for his people. All of this, my dear friends, is an attempt to have us prepared for the battle day by day, to know who Satan is, to know what Satan does, to know who Satan rules, to know how he rules, but to know also that how, how God has defeated him and how we can defeat him in our lives. Jesus Christ came to destroy the works of the devil for his people and to rescue us from the bondage of sin and the domain of darkness. We have a wonderful Savior, an all-powerful Savior. I urge you to come to him and know the deliverance from bondage that he gives. Now, next Lord's Day, we'll be looking a little further and back at angels, the good guys, as we will be looking at angels at the Incarnation, as it will be Christmas Day. But for now, again, I hope you know the battle you're in, and I pray that you'll fight every day. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we bow before you again, we ask for your help in this. We must recognize that we're unable to do this without you. We must humble, be humbled before you and ask for your help and power to defeat the schemes of the devil. Help us, please, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.